Good morning, good afternoon. Dear participants, for 50 years, the World Economic Forum has been the flag bearer for stakeholder responsibility. Today is a milestone in implementing the stakeholder principle into the management of companies. The Measuring Stakeholder Capitalism Report that has just been released by the Forum's International Business Council suggests practical metrics that companies can measure and report on. This will allow executives, investors, employees, and other stakeholders to see how the company performs on matters that reflect society as a whole, such as climate change and biodiversity, workplace diversity and inclusion, and good governance. And as a consequence, they will herald a sea change in the way companies are run and evaluated. We are very proud of these steps. We are proud that business leaders, such as the ones present here today, have taken the lead in giving meaning to stakeholder capitalism. With these metrics, the business world will finally be able to walk the talk on their commitment to ESG performance and the stakeholder principle. I look forward to the discussions that will follow now, and I want to thank Brian Moinian, who led this IBC initiative, as well as our partners from the four largest audit firms, Carmen de Sibio, Bob Moritz, Puni Trenian, and Bill Thomas, and of course, Gillian Ted of the FT for being present here today. Good morning, everyone, or as Professor Schwab just said, good afternoon, good evening, depending from wherever in the world you're watching. We're delighted you've joined us. My name is Gillian Tett. I'm with the Financial Times. I'm also co-founder of the Financial Times' this Moral Money platform, which looks at environmental, social, and governance issues, which is what we are talking about today. Specifically, we're talking about the launch of st um, stakeholder capitalism metrics, which is a rather unwieldy mouthful. We might also call it simply the launch of the accountant as an activist or the warrior accountant because the initiative to promote ESG metrics is fantastically important for anybody who can, cares about the ESG and sustainability debate. We have something of a first today, which is we have the heads of all four big accounting firms, Puneet, um, Puneet Renjan of Deloitte, Carmine De Sibio from Ernst & Young, Bill Thomas from KPMG, and Bob Moritz of PwC, all sitting together to talk about why they consider these new metrics to be so important and why this very long and very time consuming and sometimes tortuous initiative to get them launched has taken place. But we also have Brian Moynihan, who is both CEO of Bank of America and chair of the International Business Council, who's played a critical role in pushing through this whole initiative. So we're going to hear from them all about why they've done this, why it's so important and where it's going now. But I'd like to start perhaps with Brian and ask you, Brian, why did you feel that now was the time to push for these ESG metrics? Well, good morning, uh, Dillian, and uh, thank you for taking your time to help us uh, launch these metrics. I think there's a couple of key things, a couple of confluence that came together. Obviously, you just heard Klaus talk about 50 years ago, he put on the map the concept of stakeholder capitalism, thinking about all constituencies that a company has to operate against. Um, and so that's one, that's the backdrop. The other big backdrop is the sustainable development goals, which the metrics align themselves again, which the, the IBC a few years ago, three years ago now said, our companies, we will manage our companies to help make progress on the SDGs. So that's a, another key uh, criteria. Another key criteria is when a group of us signed a letter uh, saying we, we, we would achieve carbon neutrality, asking people to achieve carbon neutrality. Um, and then we've had many people respond to that. 
But then you came down to the more pragmatic question, which is how do you align capitalism mm-hmm. with the goals mm-hmm. from society and how do you make it happen and how do you measure that and how do you do it in a way that can consolidate all these measurement systems and bring one set of metrics that the big four accounting firms who will hear from the, my colleagues in that can endorse and help companies get through and publish so that people can judge whether they're making progress. Because the research shows that companies who don't make progress on ESG goals or SDG goals te- you, tend not to do as well. And those that make progress tend to do better. And so the idea is to give investors, owners, and others the ability to measure that progress so that we push what, for what society needs and use the strength of capitalism, innovation, the capital and the capabilities to help drive it forward. So it's all those events coming together. And here's a set of metrics that companies agree. And, and my big four colleagues will talk about how they've worked with companies, worked on metrics, but the companies agree are, sub, are substantial, accountable, and also meet the test of many of the different standards that are out there. Right, well, thank you, Brian. Well, I'm curious, by the way, I should say that, you know, we are, I'd like everyone improvising right now. We're talking from all over the world. We've got Klaus in Geneva, I believe. We've got Puneet, who's over in Oregon. We've got Brian in South Carolina. We've got Bill, who's in Toronto. We've got Carmine, who I think is um, actually in New Jersey. Um, And Bob, I've lost track of where Bob is, but you can tell us in a moment, or I've got you mixed up. I'm in Manhattan. So it really is um, a sign of the times. But I'd like to, so if the links go a bit funny, please, anyone watching, please um, be patient. But I'd like to turn to Puneet over in Oregon and ask you, from the point of view of Deloitte, um, why do we need even more metrics? Because we already have a horrible alphabet soup of different um, sustainability standards, um, SASB, TCFD, GRI, et cetera, et cetera. Why do we need another one? Ah. First, uh, uh, thank you for the question. I think uh, Brian addressed it, uh, Gillian. Um, to achieve results and make progress against the SDGs, uh, we believed and uh, uh, the IBC agreed uh, that we needed a common set of metrics that everybody could sign up uh, to. And that's exactly what this uh, project has achieved. And uh, Brian said this quite eloquently. I think uh, uh, it is, it is uh, proven that uh, businesses that focus on all stakeholders and the planet over the long term do better. And so what we're trying to do here is measure and as a result, uh, achieve what the SDG aspirations are with a common set of metrics. So try to incorporate the other metrics into what you're doing or have them running parallel. And then I'm going to turn to Carmine, but. Well, uh, go ahead, Carmine. Oh, well, um... let me ask, actually Puneet first. Just, just to clarify for anyone watching, are the other metrics going to run in parallel or be incorporated? No, our, our um, uh, initiative calls for these metrics to be adopted uh, and uh, they're a common set. And we've gone through a long process. We've taken a year. We've engaged extensively with the IBC members, which are the leading uh, companies in the world. And we focused on the four areas that broadly encompass the SDGs, governance, uh, people, prosperity, and the planet. And we believe that the, uh, the core metrics and the expanded metrics provide a common uh, set of metrics that uh, uh, companies are prepared to sign up for. Right. I'm going to come back to the issue in a moment about how they dovetail with other metrics. But come on, explain to us why the international business council got involved because there are other bodies out there which have been promoting metrics um you know why has the w um, ibc and the world economic forum played such a pivotal role this time around yeah so so jillian to reinforce what uh, puneet just said um the the ibc got involved and really got involved because we it was a place where companies belong to and and we could really make progress on companies uh, adhering to a common set of metrics. As Puneet said, we started over a year ago and we decided that we were all going to work on this together. We all took one of those streams that Puneet mentioned uh, and, and worked on it with Brian's team and with Klaus's team f- from the WEF. The whole concept was to not create new metrics, but to take all the metrics that are out there 
from all the frameworks that are out there. So GRI, SASB, we were actually involved, EY was involved in a, in a project called EPIC. We took all those metrics, consolidated them, uh, worked with the IBC members for over a year, as Puneet said, to come down to these 21 core metrics that we feel incorporates everything that's out there. This is not, we're not trying to replace anything out there. We're just trying to convene and come up with a common set of metrics that companies can sign up to. So, you know, there's re there are regulators, there are standard setters, um, there, there are other organizations out there uh, that have metrics that are pushing us along. But this was the time, the, the convening power of the IBC and WEF, where actually companies could come together and commit to something we thought was very important. And the idea of having all the big four working together, which is something that, as far as I know, we haven't done much of like this, um, has worked really well. So we've incorporated most of the, well, all the metrics that were out there. We have a common set, and we're really asking the IBC members and other companies in general to commit to these 21 core metrics. Right, right. As I understand it, it's actually the first time we've had the CEOs of all the big four coming together for a joint webinar like this. I mean, not quite um, on the same platform, the same virtual platform. I guess this is the accounting's version of Kumbaya moment. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I'd like to ask you, if you have a company coming to you now saying, OK, so you've made this announcement. What does it mean for us? What are you telling them? I mean, is there a clear sort of idiot's guide to how to translate this actually into business action? And are all the big four giving the same message on this one? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Julian. Let me just pick up uh, on your point. I mean, I think this, uh, I'm incredibly proud of the fact that we're all involved in this. And, and, and certainly in my tenure in this role, I can't think of a time where we came together because, uh, and I think it just highlights the importance of the topic. So, if you think about the, the benefit to uh, to companies, I think there's, to your point, there's lots of uh, benefits, but if, let me just focus on a couple. So consistency, these metrics allow companies to uh, report in a consistent way. And why is that important? They, they set their strategy, uh, you know, and, and transparently report against it. They've now got a confidence that there's a, a level, a level playing field. And I think that that, uh, frees them to sort of make decisions that, uh, that that can't happen today. And why I think we've, uh, you know, Carmine talked to it, we found the report has been well received. So in the report, you'll see 85% of the corporate respondents believe that this is uh, good for their company and even more believe that it's good for financial markets and the economy. But I think the biggest reason, I mean, if, if we're talking to uh, to, to any stakeholder through this process. One of the biggest reasons to do it is the, uh, is the impact on people. You know, if, if, if you think about uh, attracting and retaining the very best people today, they want to work for an organization that has a purpose beyond simply profits. They know that uh, business has to play a role to build a better, more sustainable society. And uh, to a point that was mentioned earlier, companies that lead on this reporting, they can look their employees in the eye and say they are uh, walking the talk, which I think uh, truly helps to attract simply the best and the brightest. Right. I mean, because the other question I have is, you know, how globally coordinated is this going to be? Because, um, you know, we haven't managed to have globally coordinated accounting standards in non-sustainability sector. Is your vision that this is going to be globally coordinated or globally adopted? Um, and if so, how does that dovetail with the fact that, you know, the European Commission is producing its own metrics right now um, and America or the federal um, element of the American government is going in different direction? I mean, um, Bob, how would you square that circle right now? Yeah, so Jillian, it's a great question, <clears throat> but let me go back to the premise. The premise is this is good for society. Society's got a number of challenges and as a result, society should benefit from this effort going forward, which is getting the right information in people's hands to make these judgments and take action. In order to do that, we wanna have consistency across the world. And what we'd like to do and avoid is that fragmentation that you described earlier. And what we're hoping for here is this is basically led by the business community. We're trying to get ahead of that alphabet soup from the various agencies, and we're trying to influence the 
regulators around the world, the standard setters around the world, the rating agencies around the world to say, these are the ones that we truly believe as a business community are the right measures to start with. We're not looking for perfection, we're looking for progress. And we'd like some consistency to demonstrate both that progress that Bill just talked about and that comparability. So the hope here is that as we go forward, we will lead, just like with accounting standards, generally accepted before rules and regulations come into place, such that the generally accepted and those that are practiced influence the rules, the regulations, and then we can cascade and scale those rules and regulations for more alignment, more consistency, and better comparability on a worldwide basis. Right. So, and Brian, from the point of view of the financial community, is this going to become the benchmark for deciding which companies banks like yourself will actually lend to or not lend to? Um, or, you know, who investment groups, asset managers should be investing in or not? I mean, is that your hope? This becomes basically the way you tell, um, you know, where money's going to flow, Brian? Well, I think that that, that's a, that is a true goal of this. And the other... So the first goal is to actually do the right thing and help make progress in the SDGs. But if you're operating a company, uh, you have a lot of people coming to you saying, do this particular element, do this particular element. What this is is more comprehensive, number one. And two, it's driven on a set of metrics that all the companies uh, uh, can disclose over time that gives uh, a chance to be judged uh, consistently and independently. And so if you think about that that's important. So as a lender, we're often asked to not lend to community to company A because they're in industry, in industry or not. And as an investor, if we have three trillion dollars in assets under management and our wealth management platforms, not allow your 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 clients to invest in company A. What we're hoping to achieve with this is saying this isn't a binary invest uh, don't don't invest. Think about having ten companies in an industry, being able to see consistent metrics across all of them. The ones at the top who are doing the right thing and making progress and whatever goals they set should, attra- should be lended to, should be invested in, and should be encouraged to keep going. That's the carrot part. The ones at the bottom who either haven't disclosed or have disclosed and aren't making the progress, people should ask them, when are you going to make the progress? Because at the end of the day, what, we're, what these metrics represent is the progress that society wants companies to make in order to help meet the goals of society. So that 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 clarity and that metric, that setting, it has a benefit to companies because they know what to disclose and how to disclose it, but also has a benefit to lenders like ourselves. We can then use it and say, look, look on those metrics. You don't have to be number one. You just have to be doing, doing something and making good progress in accordance with your goals. Then we can stay with you and help you make that transition happen. And I think that's an important difference between a divest, uh, don't, you know, a binary divest or uh, don't invest or lend or don't lend decision which becomes completely about just sort of getting out of an industry. and doesn't become about helping make all these industries make the transformation, whether it's on human capital issues, but importantly, the environmental piece is what this is, has a lot to do with in the near term. Hey, Jillian, the, the one thing I would say, if I can, this is all about information and information actually drives decision-making. And to Brian's point, what we're looking for here is, for example, a company should have better information to make their own decisions in terms of how to incent change behavioral change, process change, and focus consistent with the strategy. The investors, as Brian rightly focused on, is let's get the investors the right information to make the right decisions to have the biggest impact. As Bill Thomas talked about, let's make sure that the employees or future employees have the right information to say who is doing what and where do I want to actually contribute as an employee going forward. As a consumer, who's making the progress? So we're looking for is demonstrating the right progress and, yes, using these to make choices be it an insurer, investment bank, analyst, or otherwise. And so, well, Jillian, that comes, back, that, that, Jillian, that comes back a little bit to the question was, if we could, because this is driven by the businesses saying, we agree these are the metrics that give uh, implement the SDGs, we believe we can disclose this, and we will disclose these. What you then have is a consolidating effort among all the different standard bearers of rating agencies, everything Bill talked about, to drive them towards a set of metrics. Now, there'll be different points of view. Somebody will have a metric they like better than one of the metrics we chose, et cetera. But, but these metrics represent a lot of people's thinking, and these uh, four colleagues of mine who did a lot of work with a lot of companies, to boil down everything existed at all the different uh, standard setters and said, what are the important ones that companies can actually do? And, and that's a critical thing. This is a doable scheme. And so we already have companies that will be signing up and going. It's a doable scheme as opposed to it's a theoretical scheme. And we're about action getting stuff done. 
I think Jillian, uh, Jillian, I was just going to add, it, to me, it gives companies and it gives analysts a chance to really look at companies for the long term and look at their long term value, as Bob said, around clients, people and society uh, for all stakeholders. And I think these metrics, as they get developed, as people disclose them, you'll be able to really see a company's long term value as opposed to some of the, you know, some of the financial metrics out there now that are very short term oriented. So I do think it will be incredibly important for investors, in particular, long term thinking investors. So I'm curious, I'd like to bring in both um, Puneet and Bill on this one. Um, in terms of, you know, the breadth of these metrics, are you not concerned that they will end up looking like a jack of all trades, a master of none, that they're just too broad brush? to actually have much meaning and that you'll face more charges about greenwashing going down the, or woke washing going down the, going down the path. Puneet or um, Bill, do you have a view on that? Yeah, look, I think, uh, I think there's a, there's a potential risk there, Jillian, but the truth of the matter is, is that, uh, you know, a, a set of 21 metrics that uh, cover the gamut of uh, the four topics that we uh, that we talked about with a comply or explain type uh, uh, mindset and, and, and mandate attached to them. You know, Brian's point about uh, momentum, pragmatic and uh, and listen and tweak for uh, for potential unintended consequences is a way better route than uh, than another two years of uh, analyzing, try and get it perfect and actually don't do anything. So. Is it, is it going to be right, a perfect right out of the gate? Are we going to run into the potential for what you've just described? Sure. But I think as long as we have the right attitude, the right mindset, and we work with the organizations, we work with the standard setters to, uh, to tweak this as we go, we're going to be way better off than we would if we did nothing. And I think what I would add is, um, as has been said, uh, we started with a broad funnel. We looked at all the metrics and uh, we've, uh, in a very pragmatic way, narrowed them down in four critical areas that cover the entire gamut of uh, the SDGs. So you're looking at about three or four metrics per area in a very pragmatic, tangible way. Listen, it's been said, uh, but uh, I want to reinforce the point. This is not only the right thing to do, it is the right business thing to do. Um, and for all the points that have already been made. And so, I, Jillian, I believe you know, uh, it'll be a, a set of, a small set of tangible metrics. And I think they will be based on in the least the uh, companies that we've interacted with over the last year, there will be uh, a good take up on this. Any of you concerned that in a country like America, which is very litigious, having these metrics might leave companies open to um, liability risk? I'm happy to take that one and start if you want, but... <clears throat> Those risks exist today, right? And, and these risks, again, let's go back to the basics of what was said. What we tried to do was actually talk about and gather the metrics that already exist and put them together in a framework to get that progress and comparability noted. And as a result, one of the challenges, not only from a US, but a worldwide perspective is to talk about the downstream implications as we move forward on this journey. And that's where actually working with the regulators and agencies, government agencies, Jillian, is going to be so important as we progress this on a going forward basis. The reality is the stakeholders want and need this. In a lot of cases, they're already getting it, perhaps in bit pieces in a fragmented way by those companies, by what they say to an analyst, by what they say in a transparency report or a corporate responsibility report. Bring it together so we can actually demonstrate the comparability and progress to actually bring it to life. And we'll work through the liability issues as we move forward in various countries. It's not just a US issue, it's actually a much broader issue as we look at the world today. But hopefully we focus on the good and not necessarily downside and those minimal issues, and I'm gonna say minimal, don't get in the way of progress. We know we got challenges, but we gotta take this first step, otherwise we'll never move forward. Yeah, the other, right. I mean, this was brought up, uh, Jillian, and, and in fact, uh, we, Brian uh, hosted uh, a number of companies just in August uh, when we had our summer session at WEF. And one of the uh, CEOs that was in my uh, uh, focus group brought this up. I think it's a legitimate concern. And if you think about mitigating risk, you certainly have to mitigate legal risk. But at, if you're looking long term, you're also interested in brand and brand risk. If you don't do this, I think you are uh, subjecting your brand because there are multiple stakeholders that are asking for this. 
um, to, uh, to risks. So you've got to, I mean, we're certainly going to mitigate legal risk as, as Bob said, but uh, brand risk needs to be uh, taken into account as well. So in practical terms, um, as I understand it, but none of you are yet able to implement all of these 21 or 34 metrics right now in your own operations, but you're aiming to do so in January, is that correct? And you're hoping that the IBC members, so 130 of those will be, um, essentially most of them will be implementing it in the 2021 accounts. Is that correct? Yeah, Brian, so the, do you have the, any thoughts? On that? Sure, the, uh, Jillian, the path forward really was, this started almost two years ago but with this group of companies uh, talking about short-term, long-term issues over the last couple of years before that. And we came to the idea that one of the things you had to do is be able to measure stakeholder cap capitalism and long-term strategic progress on the things that are critical. And so th this has been a long time. So there's been a lot of work done to sort of decipher the metrics and go through them, everything my colleagues have described. That piece is behind us now. The consultation is done. This has been taken in front of many, many different account accounting groups, uh, standard setters, rating agencies, uh, and uh, investors, et cetera. So now the idea is today we release the document. And now the question is, what do we do next? Well, we have a bunch of companies who have signed up and said, I will start disclosing these. Sometimes they can't disclose every one of them because they're still working on the calculation going to your point that you want to make sure it's right. And this accounting firms are helping them figure out how to make sure that number is findable through the books and records of the company and can be you know, attested to and, and make sure the CEOs and, those, and the CFOs feel comfortable. So one is we get companies signing up, but with a goal of by between now and sort of January timeframe when the WEF annual meeting would be, we'd have a group of companies signing that would be released that those companies are on board to disclose immediately what they can uh, and then what they can over the next couple of years and then sort of roll through. The question that comes up then is, okay, those are big 130 companies. What do you do after that? Well, all of us have been working with groups there of directors that are on uh, medium-sized company boards, uh, it, even private uh, investors saying these metrics may not, every one of them might not apply to a non-public company, uh, for example, but the idea is we have to get all companies to agree that this goes on or a substantial majority. Otherwise, you might start to see arbitrage to private companies, state-owned companies who won't agree to make these disclosures. So that's another round of work that's going on. But the core near term is get the people to sign up. Uh, and, and start disclosing and let that momentum carry this as being a standard of which then the rest of the standard bearers can start to coalesce around. Right. So basic message is, although Davos is not going to happen, the World Economic Forum in person in January, there will be a round of online meetings and discussions in January. So watch this space. And there's going to be a lot of work in 2021 coming up in relation to this. Um, sadly, very sadly, we are out of time. Um, there's going to be a virtual session afterwards in the lounge linked to top link from with the World Economic Forum, where anyone who's watching who wants more discussion with a friendly accountant will find representatives, senior representatives from the big four waiting to answer all of your questions um, collaboratively. And also you can read the entire report um, online at the WEF's website. Um, so it just remains for me to say a big thank you to all of you from taking part from everywhere from Toronto through to South Carolina, through to Oregon and Geneva and Manhattan. Thanks to all of you for watching. And on a personal note, I should say that as someone who trained as an anthropologist, I used to think that it was going to be activist anthropologists chaining themselves to bulldozers who were going to change the world on the green side. Um, it's been quite humbling to discover actually it may end up being a new um, breed of warrior accountant who's picking up the green and social activist agenda. But accounting is something which is not usually seen as being deeply cool or involved in activism, but it's certainly interesting to see how it's developing now. So best of luck to all of you in tr trying to reshape the world through the accounting systems. We'll be tracking it closely at the Financial Times and Moral Money platform. And I look forward to hearing more of the debate through the World Economic Forum and IBC going forward. So thank you.